All right, let's do it. Cool, cool. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Dev Twitch stream. Uh, my name is Nick Taylor. I'm a lead software engineer at Forum. Forum is the software that powers Dev. Uh, Christina's not here today. She's on vacation. So enjoy your vacation, Christina. Um, and let's get to it. We're here today with James Q. Quick from Oz Zero. He's a developer marketing media manager there. And we're going to talk about all kinds of things today. DevRel, authentication, and Jamstack, and any other questions you have for James. Thanks for coming on, James. And uh, I know you're a busy person, so thanks for taking the time to come hang with us. Yeah, absolutely. I've uh, gotten to poke in on several of your streams in the past and have uh, secretly been <laughs> wanting an invite. So I'm excited to be here. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. That's nice. Awesome. OK, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, you're at Oz0 now, but I was wondering if we could take a step back before we start talking about Oz0 and DevRel. Like, uh, if you wanted to maybe just talk a bit about what your career path's been, like in, in your own words, like uh, we don't have to do the 30-minute uh, thir uh, biography from television or anything, but uh, uh, just feel free to say whatever you'd like to about how you got to where you are today. Yeah. Um, I'd be really curious if people have questions about any of this. So let me know in the chat. Um, I have a computer science degree, so I feel like that's almost the not the norm anymore. Like I feel like so many people are self-taught. They go through boot camps, they go through YouTube and Udemy courses and that sort of stuff. Um, and actually, I feel like I resonate more with self-taught because my reflecting on my computer science degree, I really didn't learn the things that I should have learned, to be honest. Like I treated it as school and I was trying to get good grades uh, and I didn't really focus on like really understanding what I was doing and understanding why I was doing it and what the I don't know appreciating programming for what it was and what it could be for me in terms of a career so um, anyway I was applying for jobs coming out of college uh, or in college senior year and Microsoft was recruiting on campus I interviewed for a a software engineer position with Microsoft, which I did not get. And then I okay. interviewed for a TAM role, a technical account manager, which I did not get. Okay. And in those interviews, they thought that I would be a good fit for Microsoft, just not those roles. And they started to kind of learn a little bit about me and my kind of social personality and me enjoying being around people, working with people, teaching people. And so that came the technical evangelist role. They had an opening. Okay uh available that they were hiring someone fresh out of college so i actually started my career at microsoft as a technical evangelist uh giving talks doing guest lectures uh workshops all that sort of stuff never had done any content or speaking ever before so this is like a completely brand new thing to me that i just like lucked into like i didn't know about okay. devrel i didn't know about evangelism like no context whatsoever um, so anyway, I did that for three years. Uh, my wife and I moved to Memphis after that, and I started working at FedEx doing software development and got into architecture, which I really enjoyed and I really needed like that dedicated full-time software development role. But I also yeah. realized that I really missed speaking. I wanted to be like at conferences. I wanted to do YouTube videos again. Uh, so I was doing all that stuff in my personal time and then decided I wanted to get paid to do it again full-time. <laughs> And started yeah, yeah. looking at uh, looking at roles, and uh, started working with Auth Zero back in uh, early 2020. Oh, okay, cool, cool. And so Auth Zero is where you're at now. And um, as as I mentioned at the start, uh, you're a developer marketing media manager. That's <laughs> correct. And uh, that's right. Cool. Yeah. So so what is that role exactly, and and how does it relate to DevRel? That's my segue to get into DevRel for us. So. There you go. Nicely done. I like it. Um, yeah, so this is uh, one, it's a brand new uh, position at Osiro. I don't know if this okay. specific role, especially the title exists in other places. But this okay. kind of stemmed from like my experience with video content and my personal stuff. And then my experience with our video content at Osiro and trying a way trying to find a way for me to kind of progress in my career while also being able to leverage that expertise for the stuff that we do more specifically. So I do, in theory, I'll do a little less of the traditional DevRel activities. I won't travel as much as I, in theory, would have uh, pre-COVID. Okay. Um, but I'll still speak at conferences occasionally, still do things like this to be out there in front of the community. 
Uh, but I also, the majority of my time will be focused on like the technical video content that we do. Um, how do we streamline the process for us to create that content? How do we okay. kind of think about repurposing that content in different formats, uh, exploring different forms of media? So Twitch streams could be one. Twitter spaces is another. I really want to get into like TikTok and do some of these more creative uh, pieces of content. I think that would be a lot of fun. And then yeah. the last aspect of uh, this would be uh, kind of sponsoring and helping grow or helping community developers and content creators in the community grow. So especially okay. if there's overlap for us to like sponsor a newsletter or sponsor a stream or sponsor a podcast, uh, for us to sponsor content that people create that's uh, not necessarily focused on Auth0 but includes Auth0 in some capacity. Uh, okay. I'm really looking for opportunities to get involved with uh, with content creators in that regard. No, that's 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 really cool, and I mean, I feel like content creation is like exploding right now. Like, just mm -hmm. everybody's wanting to do it, or 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 is already doing it. Like, I I can definitely think of some notables, like uh, Cassidy Williams, who was on the stream a few weeks ago. She she kills it on TikTok. Her, if you check out her yep. pinned tweet, it's her one about reply guys chasing her, and she's like in a she's in like <laughs> a forest or something. It's it's obviously <laughs> got got some dark undertones to it, but it's hilarious, and I I think it's got like. Mm -hmm almost like one and a half million views or something um wow. and i know uh, uh b dougie uh, brian douglas from github he's he's gotten into tiktok too i mean he does a lot of youtube creation content creation as well um yourself you've done a lot of youtube as well right um that's is that like your primary place where you do your content creation right now or yeah, definitely. Definitely is the primary place. Um, so I started a YouTube channel when I was at Microsoft just because I was teaching the same thing over and over again to in workshops. And I was like, why don't I create videos and I can just tell people to go watch them for easier scalability. And yeah. uh, anyway, so I started it then. I didn't do videos for a while and then started taking it seriously about three years ago. Um, and I've done a video or two every week for that yeah. amount of time. So um, I've got the consistency down. Uh, I really love, I really enjoy, love creating the video content. And again, like now I want to experiment not only personally, but also with work stuff in different formats. Okay. Um, so I want to embrace just exactly like Cassidy. Like Cassidy is basically my idol in terms of like this type <laughs> of content of just injecting cheesiness yeah. and personality and like your you, like who you are into the content that you create. And I think that's why her stuff resonates so well and yeah. people respond to it so much is because it it's like it's just it's your average person not average in a bad way but like genuinely that's kind of who yeah. she is and you get a feel for that through her content so i i want to inject more of me into the stuff i do and get a little more creative with the content that i create yeah i definitely agree with that like if if you can't be yourself i mean it's the same thing like at your job if you can't be like who you really are you know i mean uh it's it mm -hmm. kind of you come off as fake or because you're not being yourself, obviously, but it's, uh, yeah, I think, I think adding that genuineness is, is really cool to do as well because everybody's different. Right. So like, you know, everybody's quirky in some way or, or like mm -hmm. funny in their own way. So it's, I, I can definitely see how it, it would make the, the, the content creation a lot more appealing. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we talked, a bit about content creation and, and what your new role is at Oz Zero. I was kind of curious if we could kind of dig into DevRel a little more. Um, I've I've spoken to a few people about it, uh, but I'm curious what your take on like what do you what do you consider DevRel is? Because uh, I know you know there's all the jokes too, like developer avocados. Uh, there was yeah. we were speak we were speaking to a few people on the new relic devrel team and you know there's other folks who have these opinions like oh devrel it's easy you're just you know going on vacation partying and like giving a talk and going home which is 100 not the case there, there, a lot of hard work goes into this so i just wonder if you could just talk a bit about what devrel is to you yeah uh, i i agree there is like I think there's this misconception in DevRel and then content creation too. Of like one, you see polished videos or you see a polished talk at a conference, yeah, and you th you just kind of assume that that person is perfect and they know it all and and blah blah blah. And that's like never the case. Like 
all the preparation that goes into a YouTube video or speaking at a conference, there's lots that goes into it. And one of the things that I actually like about live streaming is you get to yeah. see a little bit more of those details, like behind the scenes, like you get to see your average developer struggle, just like everyone else yeah. does, right? Like everyone goes through the same type of stuff, but you don't see that as much in a polished video or a final talk or something like that. Um, anyway, sure. so Devrel for me, it, it's so much about like earning trust in the community and just showing up in your communities and for your communities. And I hear, I talk about this a lot. I hear other people talk about it is meeting developers where they are. So this is actually a really good example of what we're doing now of Twitch has become so much more popular for developers, especially during COVID. Like I think it was already on the rise, but especially during COVID, like so many people now not only stream, but so many people and developers now are watching streams and they want to yeah. get some of that personality to see how people think through things. And I think this is the perfect example of staying up with like not trends in a bad way, trends in a good way of just like where are developers and how do we meet them where they are and interact with them in ways that they're used to and excited to be interacted with. So that like means spending time on streams. Hopefully soon we get to do like the in conference thing. I just told Will who's in the chat like um, I got accepted at KCDC, Kansas City Developer Conference. So I'm super excited okay. to go and be at my first in-person conference in a year and a half. Like that's going to be wild. Um, but being up, being at those uh, types of things, being there where the community is, I think is first and foremost how you like, you earn that level of trust. Like for me, DevRel is never about me preaching first about a product or a company I work okay. for. It's about earning trust first and then showing how and where this thing might make sense to help enable something that you're trying to build. And for us, like, okay. or at least with all, all zero, the way I think about it is like, I want people out there to be able to create the stuff that they want to create. And all zero doesn't at all need to be the, the focus of that. It's just an enabler. Okay. Like by using all zero, the, the goal is for me that you have a positive experience and then it helps enable you to build the thing that you really care about quicker and with more security around it, like to feel more comfortable yeah. that it's going to get the job done and you don't have to do all of that work yourself. So earning trust, creating content that's one genuine to me, but um, also useful for an audience, whatever audience you have, whatever format it's in. Uh, and yeah. another aspect of this that people don't think about as much is the taking feedback from the community back into okay. the product for Auth0. So developer advocates, they're gonna be the most, for the most part, the most customer, not customer, the most community facing, the most public facing people that you have at your company. Yeah. Like when you think about one of these companies, DevRel advocates, those are the people that you've seen in videos and at conferences and stuff. So a lot of times you're the most public facing figures of a company. And with yeah. that means that you can hopefully have these conversations with developers that other people may not have insight to. So when they have feedback, positive or negative, how do you take all that in and translate that and send it along to product teams so that they actually know what it's like for the people that are actually using this stuff? So I think like a bunch of different aspects of DevRel, there's like taking that feedback and forwarding on, having relationships with product and SDKs and that sort of stuff. There's creating content to help people uh, do X, Y, and Z with your product. And there's also creating content just to earn that trust and to be that personality, which is I talked about like TikTok and some of these like yeah, a little yeah. more quirky things. Cause like you think about Cassidy and you think about, I think you think about her first cause her brand is so incredible, but you also know that Netlify is right behind that and you trust anything yeah. that she does with Netlify is going to be amazing because of who she is and what her brand is. So I think she's got the, the perfect level of again being genuine and providing value and then having that then come back to al almost secondarily but not quite to the actual company yeah. or product itself yeah no i think those are all great points like the the whole thing about trust too and like you know you know meeting developers and not necessarily trying to be like a snake oil salesman you know where you know like <laughs> you know just buy Oz zero because i work there you know like obviously no. You, you want your product to be a good product, but that ties into what you're saying about getting the feedback. Like nobody has a perfect product or it's always improving. So I think that's amazing that you, you can take this can hopefully constructive feedback from people because uh, not everybody's <laughs> constructive sometimes, but uh, and just improve the product. And and at the same time, you're still building these relationships with these people that you're meeting, you know, like and who knows, maybe 
maybe you meet somebody at a conference, they don't need Auth0 now for whatever reason. And then maybe two years down the road, you bump into them. Hey, James, yeah, I remember you at KCDC, you know, like, oh, yeah, well, we're looking at authentication now. Uh, uh, you mind, you know, taking me through Auth0, how that all works. So, like, you know, and, and this, I don't know, I, like, obviously, at Forum, we're all big on community. Uh, that's, like, our bread and butter. And it's, I really do think, you know, like, software is there, obviously, but it's the people that are the game changer, you know? So uh, this this definitely ties into everything you're saying, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. It's, uh, there's it's... yeah. Go ahead. Man. <laughs> <laughs> We're both waiting on each other, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you kind of touched on one of the other aspects of Devrel that is a challenge, I think. So you mentioned the idea of like if I speak at a conference, or if I meet somebody at a conference, or they see me in a live stream or YouTube video, and then a year later, they're like, Oh, I need something for authentication. I remember James did this thing, let me reach out to him. That's the yeah. that's the kind of impact that is really, really hard to track. So one of the difficult things in DevRel is what what are metrics like, and what do they yeah. mean? And then what are the things that like, you almost really can't track and you just have to go almost based on faith. Right. Like we you do some of these things like showing up at a conference. Rarely does that automatically lead to signups or there's no way for me to track that someone watched um, watched the talk I gave and then went and signed up. But I can highlight those stories after the fact of, hey, someone said they remember me from here or I've had countless yeah. people reach out on Twitter with a question or I comment on something that they have a problem that they're having with Lost Hero and offer that like one on one engagement, either through messaging or in a Zoom call. And that's the kind of stuff I think that like it's hard to track up front, but then you can capitalize and re report and celebrate those like moments of, of what that work has led to. But that's one of the things we're actually doing now is kind of spending some focus, some big focus as we transition a little bit in our team of what Q3 and Q4 look like, what our goals are specifically, and then how do we track that? Like, how do we know if we're effective? And I would say for people that maybe are interested in DevRel, that's one of the constant struggles is, is how do you know you're doing a good job? And there's lots of different ways that you can yeah. track metrics. And there's lots of different things you can go based on, but it is it is a tough one. And there's some things that just aren't aren't super clear cut in terms of trackability. So that's one of the challenges I think that people should have if they're interested, at least in the back of their heads of what it's really yeah. like. No, it, it really is a good point because you, like you said, there, there's just, well, I mean, maybe there are some ways of knowing, like you can, you know, like obviously like analytics and stuff for some things, but mm -hmm. you, you, you can't really grab a metric on you met so-and-so two years ago at a conference. And then like two years later, they want to buy the product now. Mm -hmm. like, that's just building good relationships. But, but yeah, again, how do you, how do you quantify, you know, like this is the the good re relationship pipeline because I mean, at, at the end of the day, a product is being sold, or or like yep. you know, and like sales pipelines in general are usually take a while. You know, like when you're getting new customers, uh, maybe it's uh, I'm I'm kind of thinking more in the context of when I worked in e-commerce, we would get clients and like like folks would be like, you know, nine months later, they've sealed the deal or whatever for like a big contract. But, yeah. you know, with software, it might be different because it's, you know, it's just, you know, sign up, download it. I mean, they're still creating the relationship and stuff, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. How do you, how do you tie all that into like the sales pipeline? I mean, you can obviously get some kind of metrics saying like we sold like, you know, a thousand more licenses this month or something. But again, how do you, how can you be certain it was because of other events? So it's anything it's you did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, you, you obviously you like yeah. to, to think it was you that helped with this, but it, it that is really a, a tough problem to crack. And, and I guess on the flip side too, like, do you always need to care about those metrics? Like if sales are going well, do I mean, I know there's people that do care about it. So I guess it always does matter. But uh yeah, I think you, it's a, just like any other team would be, I think you have to advocate for your value. Um, I think yeah. uh, Kim Maida, who used to work at Auth0, um, is now at Narwhal, I believe, but she wrote an article recently about kind of the metrics for DevRel, where DevRel belongs in terms of like an organization, where in the marketing org, and I think that's kind of what, what she settled okay. on as well. Um, 
I she kind of started to advocate that like Devrel is not as unknown as it used to be, which I like 100% agree with. But I think it's still one of those yeah. things that's not again because it's less tangible and it is still newer. It's still one of those things that's still tricky to advocate for. So I think that's where like leadership in a Devrel uh, team or broader like our in our case developer marketing. I think that's where that leadership becomes really really important because you you have someone that can take um take what you're doing and take the things that are there kind of like the raw the raw data of sorts yeah and translate that into stuff that that really makes sense to other people like a terrible term but higher ups like like people <laughs> higher yeah, up yeah. that need need that visibility so having having that person that can do the translation and is also really eager uh to advocate for you and your team is really important because it yeah. Like we said a couple of times, sometimes it's not easy to track that. But if you look at like, you look at the funnel for how sales ultimately works, like your broadest piece of that funnel, your broadest input is just awareness, right? Like the, the yeah. although awareness may not, may not directly lead to something, awareness then facilitates these people going down that funnel and like the, it gets uh, narrower and narrower as you go down. But awareness yeah. is a big piece of that. So you can start to say, like, we were able to get we were able to get in front of X number of developers through live streams, through podcasts, through videos. You can start to have that number and then look at how you facilitate people moving down this funnel. And those individual developers that that like I that we would work with or that we would target, like we're not going into yeah. enterprises right now and pitching stuff. We're doing content for the average individual developer. But as yeah. that developer goes to work and as work is having a conversation about, hey, we need something to help us solve auth problems, that person can say, I've tried out Auth Zero in my spare time for this reason. I think it would be a good fit. So that actually does have a significant impact, even though you may not be able to track it all the way down, like just yeah. just dumping stuff into that funnel, raising that awareness, giving people a reason to try it out contributes to what then becomes sales opportunities later on down the road, even if they're not directly associated with the work that we did. Yeah. And it's, it's nice in the sense that you don't necessarily have to be like cold calling or like presenting in front of you know, mm -hmm. like, here's my PowerPoint about people who don't care. You, you, <laughs> you've just got a, you got a few devs yeah. coming in just saying, yeah, I installed last zero and uh, works pretty well. So, Hey, why don't we try it out? You know, cause they're the ones building the software, yep. you know, so that, yeah, no, I think that's a great point. Um, yeah, so it's the other things I've heard about DevRel, and I'm not completely well versed with it, but there's like there is a marketing side to it, but there, there's like it it depends who you report to. I think like like you could report to marketing or to uh, I don't know what the other part if it's engineering. Like like I think they could be placed in different spots, and that affects how they work potentially. It definitely could. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I, I don't know that I have enough like specific experience to, to give details on how those things become differently. But yeah, like if you're the way you approach thing and the way things and the way you track metrics and stuff could certainly be dependent upon what your team is within a company or what company you're working for, what the culture is at that company. So all those things can absolutely vary. But we, we sit in the marketing org um, at all zero. Okay. Other uh, other DevRel teams, as you said, they could be like tied to engineering and product. Again, thinking about like DevRel or advocates being those people who have that direct line of interaction and feedback with developers out there that are using the product. Having them yeah. more closely aligned in that sense makes sense. And then also another potential broader org could be sales. Um, so when I was in Microsoft, we were... I think we were lumped under sales and we went to like the big sales conference. Um, okay. MGX, I think it was the big one. That's actually like I started at that conference, which was uh, okay, yeah. pretty wild because it was like 20,000 internal attendees for Microsoft. But um, okay, yeah. the interesting thing was it was a sales conference and we were technically under sales, but like very little of what they talked about directly related to my job. And, then, and okay. I feel like this is going to be somewhat the case regardless of where you fit because sales sales is not fully going to understand what it's like to do things that don't directly translate to numbers product yeah, yeah. is not going to understand as much of that stuff that doesn't directly lead to feedback or interaction with their products and then marketing is still there's a little bit of 
um, not necessarily struggle, but there's a little bit of disconnect. I think when I like when I am in marketing calls with other people and they're using buzzwords like demand gen and go to market and all these different things, I don't I don't quite resonate with that stuff just because DevRel still is unique, even though it, I think we make sense in our marketing org. It's still unique. And I feel like we have a lot of learning kind of cross uh, across teams. And that's one of actually my personal goals this quarter and a half maybe is to understand more of just marketing as a whole what all those buzzwords are what the different strategies are that they're working on that okay. then still leads back to awareness and signups and dollars spent at the end of the day so there's similar goals at the end but those yeah. like just traditional marketing aspects i just i don't know as much about yeah no uh i i don't know too much about marketing either so <laughs> uh, uh, from some basic stuff but um uh, another question I had, and, and I don't know if you have the answer to this or not, but I, I feel like DevRel has definitely exploded in the past four, four or five-ish years. Like, I feel like, I, I don't know if it's correct, but Microsoft had like this huge explosion of DevRels, and I feel like just a lot of companies just started doing a lot more mm -hmm. DevRel. And uh, the question I had is, do you know when it's a good time f or when it's makes sense for a company to create a DevRel team? Like there must be like a tipping point at some point. Cause you know, obviously if you're a startup of, you know, two people, you know, the, the co-founder slash CEO or whatever, that, that makes no sense probably, but there's, there's gotta be some point where you're like, you know, okay, I think it makes sense now to actually, you know, have a team. Um, and again, I don't know if you have the answer to this. I'm just throwing it out there. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, again, situations that I've not really been put in. Um, started at Microsoft, and they're huge, right? Like, kind of okay. as big yeah, as it yeah. gets in terms of DevRel. All Zero had had uh, a DevRel team for a couple of years at least already. But I think okay. a couple of things that I would think about is, like, do you have a, do you have a product that you're ready for people to use like it could be it could be a beta thing it could be a 1.0 or it could be whatever but like do you have a product that you want to raise awareness to to get exposure to to have people use and start that feedback loop another aspect that i've seen this mix a lot with is documentation um okay. so if you think about creating content as as a devrel like the first thing i do is i go to a getting started page if you're looking at like a new SDK or a new technology or new whatever, you go to a getting started page and you follow those docs. Then for me, I watch a lot of video content. So I look like I would much rather have a video version of that thing um, than a written version, even though I could get by with written. So you start looking at like, what's the content that you have? What's the content that you need just logistically for like, as people have these questions come up, how do they do these things? How do you answer those questions in some form of content? So you can kind of look at like, doing documentation as a big part of what DevRel can be. I think eventually you kind of okay. scale out, out of that where like we don't own documentation per se in DevRel. Like there's a docs yeah. team that I think makes sense again at scale. But as you have as you have a product to share that you want more hands-on experience with, that you want more people to try out, I think that's when you you start to look at what an individual in DevRel can do for you of yeah. making the things that they do just having that brand behind it and a lot of times that starts from an individual that's already there that's doing some of the stuff then they look at like all right we want to take this a little more seriously we're starting to scale we've got some money we hire our yeah. first devrel person and then you start to scale out teams one at a time or a few at a time right as you start to grow as a company as you start earning more revenue or getting more funding so that your yeah. influence and your awareness starts to scale out through that team that gets built out as well but i think it's pretty I feel like it's now become a standard. Like, I don't know exactly when that tipping point is, but the fact yeah, that yeah. there's a DevRel team at almost every tech company or at some point, like at some point they get to the point and they buy in completely. That's yeah. a really interesting thing that I feel like we've accepted that no matter if it's hard to track, sometimes the impact, no matter if the metrics sometimes are hard, like DevRel yeah. has become almost a universally accepted. Like we have to have this kind of, team to get our stuff in front of developers that we want to use or that we want those developers to use our product yeah no for sure uh no that's great um thought we could maybe switch over a bit uh we, we were going to talk a bit about uh the jam stack 
Um, I know you uh, you obviously have experience with eye medication. I mean, that's what Oz Zero does. <laughs> um, uh, I guess we could kick it off with like, uh, what are the differences with authentication within the Jamstack versus a uh, traditional application, like just, you know, old school server side rendered, you know, you still log in, but uh, so maybe we could maybe start there to just kind of go over maybe what the differences are a bit uh, or, or that you that you think are different about that. Sure. The... <laughs> The really interesting thing is like what had become really different. Now we're kind of cycling back to where the concept of server side rendered stuff is becoming more and more popular. So like Ruby on Rails 10, 15 years ago or however long, like really exploded, like the, the server side rendered frameworks and that became a standard for several years. And then we got into single page apps. We got into like Ember and Angular JS and then what is now Angular React Views felt that sort of stuff. But then now we've started to throw back on top of those things, frameworks like Nuxt and Gritsum and SvelteKit and Next and Gatsby and all these things that just sit on top of those frameworks so that we bring back the capabilities of having either just like regular static pages and or uh, server-side rendered pages. So we've kind of gone in this like circle of migrating into what has become the Jamstack, which is really just taking tools that we'd already used and combining them, at least in my opinion, in a different way, in a different unique way, and figuring out how to be really creative of how we combine them. So anyway, if you look at like um, traditional security stuff, authentication in server-side render pages, uh, server-side render pages, you'd have like a login route and uh, login route will serve a login page or you could have login embedded on another page and you'll fill in credentials. It'll send it to the server. The server yeah. will uh, check against the database to make sure that those are valid credentials and it will create a session for a user. Now this is, okay. since these would be server-side render pages, your front end and your back end would live on the same domain, which means yeah. that you could track a uh, session in uh, cookies, for example. So you could uh, generate like a session ID, you could save that session ID in your database, send that along in a cookie to the front end, and then each subsequent request that would go to the back end of your application would include that session ID on the yeah. server side. You would take that session ID, go and look for the session in the database. If the session is there, you know you have a valid session and you can get any relevant details about the user or whatever that you need to finish whatever that request is. Yeah. So then, we started moving into the spa age where uh, one thing especially got more complicated where we started having our front ends and our back ends more separated. So if you have a single page app, single page React app, for example, and you have a node yeah. back end as an example, those things don't necessarily have to live on the same domain. They could be two completely separate projects. They could be deployed in different ways. They could be deployed in different spaces. They don't have to have the same domain, which starts to complicate that idea of tracking sessions with uh, cookies because you can't have those cross domain cookies. Yeah. So JWTs, JSON Web Tokens, became really popular in this regard where instead of having a piece of state that's in your uh, database, you can have your you can have a token, a JSON Web Token, okay. that embedded inside of that token is the information you need about a, a valid user or this user um, being logged in. There's a little bit of okay. caveat to that. Uh, there's the idea of like, if you go to a movie theater, if, if you pay for a ticket and you walk up with your ticket, you can get in. But you can also get in if you like somebody drops a ticket and you find it on the ground. It's not tied. Yeah. It, like there's no there's no intrinsic meaning to the fact that you have the ticket. It's just that you have a valid ticket, which means you can get in. So JWTs work in this this similar way of like, there's no way to guarantee who the token is coming from. But if I get a token on the yeah. server and I can validate that thing, then I can trust the information that's inside of it and trust that that user is who they're pretending to say they are, who they're saying they are, I guess, just based on the token itself. So yeah. this this gives some benefits in the sense that like you don't have to depend on cookies from different domains. Um, okay. You also then don't have to do an additional database request every time you have a user do something. So in the session world, you have a user is authenticated, they send a request to the back end, which includes the session ID, which means you then have to go and prompt the database to see if that session actually exists in the database. Now, with your tokens, I see, pause me if, if you need to. Now, with these tokens becoming, <laughs> with them becoming more popular, 
you can do you can intrinsically like validate these tokens right there on the server without having to make any database requests and you can trust that if those tokens turn out to be valid you could get into the details of the signature and how that is used to validate but if that thing is valid you can trust the information that's inside of it and not have to make subsequent database requests so in that sense okay. they're a little bit more independent or they're a lot more independent and they can they're a little bit faster in terms of authentication or and or authorization in your okay. uh, in your server endpoints. So you had SSR, uh, like the original stuff with Ruby on Rails kind of being one of the big kickoffs with that. You had your session yeah. and cookie combination. Then you move into JSON web tokens becoming more and more popular in the single page application space. Now with things like Nux and Next.js and SvelteKit, things that have API endpoints kind of embedded inside of them, you can yeah. start to see a little bit of a mix because the front end and the back end are on the same domain. So you can still use cookies for information if you want to. Uh, you can also embed your JWT inside of the cookie if you want to. So that way you're still avoiding having to go and do a database request, but it's safely yeah. transmitted between your front end and your back end since they're on the same domain. So some of that stuff has kind of reverted <laughs> to back to the way uh, okay. it was before uh, single page apps. But I think at the end of the day, like there's the Jamstack enables this combination in different use cases, depending on or different different ways to go about it. All the ones that we mentioned, depending on your specific use case. So Jamstack just enables this flexibility of if you understand how the different opportunities you have for building apps, how those work, then you can choose your uh, authentication strategy around that to make it work with what you're doing. Okay, cool. Um, I dropped the, I know I found this a while ago, but the Oz Zero published a JWT handbook. So I dropped that link uh, in the chat. Um, also just wanted to mention something because not uh, some of the folks that watch the stream are, are just starting off on their tech journey. So uh, uh, just in regards to what you were talking about cookies, um, I think sometimes people don't realize that the web is stateless. And that, that's why we have cookies and stuff. So so just to what James was saying before, when we have to go back to the database and stuff, it's it's kind of to say like, this is who I am. You have to go get me again. And then I can know where you are to give you back a response uh, that's that's tailored to that user. Um, the, uh, the other thing I was curious about the JWTs is you have a, a signature in there, uh, and there's also some other meta information about a, a, a user. But typically, yep. that information that's stored in there that's like readable is is not the best practice. From what I know, is you shouldn't put anything that's you know a security risk in there. Like don't you know like password stuff like that or anything you deem I guess private. <laughs> um, so sensitive, it, yeah. So. Yeah. So basically you have the you have the signature which is what you're able to use on the server side like whether it whether it's serverless or just classic server side rendered and then the rest is just information that flows along but we know it's valid so like you know if my signature was valid and it says Nick Taylor in there we we know it's me still when it comes back. Um, um, yep. And that that validation for um, I don't know if we spelled this out all the way. JSON Web Tokens is JWTs. I, I usually try to say that at least once so people know the abbreviation. Okay. Um, the 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 ability to validate JWTs is what's really crucial about it. So you basically like you take all the information from the body and the header and you kind of combine yeah. them together and then uh, you sign them. So you have you have this uh, verify signature that's included in, okay. in the actual token itself. And then basically on the server, when you receive this token, you take those first two pieces, the metadata about the token, and then the metadata that the body, which in this case would include okay. a little bit of user info. And you kind of do that same thing. And then you compare these signatures to make sure that they match up, which means okay. because like anyone can go and decode the information that's in a JWT, like you can go to JWT.io, paste in a token, you can see all the information that's there. So to your point, nothing in there should be private. You, you don't want to put sensitive information in there. But the, the reason you can trust that information is if anybody tampered with that information, if they try to generate a token without having the original signing key or the original yeah. like public uh, private key pair, 
they will not be able to generate a valid signature with different data than what's already there. So we have, have the ability to fully validate that if I receive this token, if the signature and the data match up, I can, I yeah. can confirm not that the token is coming from the right person, but that the token okay. was generated correctly. And this goes back to that idea of movie theater. If you show up with a yeah. ticket, I'm not looking at your ID and your credit card to see if you're the one that bought that ticket. I'm just looking at this ticket granting you access. And that's the way that JWTs work in this case as well. Okay. And in terms of like, if we, if we talk about traditional server side for a second, you can definitely do all different kinds of authentication, including JWT, you know, with cookies, mm -hmm. uh, SAML tokens, like, like, uh, I used to work on some identity management stuff and SAML is definitely complicated. Uh, but, uh, if we go back to the jam stack is, uh, is JW, are J, JWTs, uh, JSON web tokens considered like the standard way to do authentication in Jamstack or, uh, or are there other preferred ways as well? Yeah. Um, I think you, I see them more and more. Um, again, some of this goes back to, uh, or one of the things that this gets into is your need potentially to call a third party. API. So a lot yeah. of APIs have security around them that are dependent upon access tokens in the form of JWTs. So yeah. if you're potentially calling like a third party API, it may be a requirement that you have this access token, this JWT that you can pass along in that request so that you can validate okay. who you are in the request to a third party API. Um, in addition to that, if you're just talking like your own apps, um, it, it depends. So if you look at like if you're not on the same domain, so your front end and your back end are on different domains, you yeah. are pretty much having to use your JWTs because it's completely stateless. Because you're not able to track anything in your cookie, you have to attach yeah. something in each request that you send. And that in this case would often be your JSON web token. If you have things that are on the same domain, you can actually like treat it just like your regular SSR where you don't need to have uh, JWT at all. JWTs are still convenient because you can do the validation without hitting that database. Um, but you could do like the session ID inside of a cookie and go and look that up and that sort of stuff. But you can also combine to where you can have a JWT be the token, the thing that's stored in the cookie, and then have that be parsed and validated on the server in every request and not have to manually send it along also. Okay. Okay, yeah. No, that makes sense. Um... I'm curious about serverless. I've done very little serverless, um, but in terms of authentication, like so, say we've got our Jamstack site, which is 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 a static site, pretty much. You know, could have some interactive interactivity due to like, you know, uh, React or Vue or Svelte um, or or some other framework. Uh, but when we go to uh, make a request to some serverless endpoint. Uh, I'm, I imagine JWTs would probably be more preferred because with a cookie, you typically need a database and like rehydrating the session. And at, at least from the minimal stuff I know about serverless, that seems a little more complicated if you were to do that. Uh, I'm not sure if that's right or not, but just throw it out there. Yeah. Um... Some of that still, or a big portion of that still depends on front end and back end serverless in this okay. case, being on the same domain or not. So you oh, can yeah. do, you can attach things to cookies if you're serverless, even if you're doing serverless, if they're still in the same domain. So you can still kind of treat that like your traditional setup. Um, one thing to consider though is in serverless, like you mentioned the idea of state statelessness. You can technically, like if you have a full node server, you have the ability to have some state like the application is running you could save things in memory if you want to but yeah. as it restarts or you, or you redeploy all that stuff is gone so you, you like can have state yeah. inside of that although there's not many real scenarios for that to make a lot of sense but okay. with serverless you're strictly stateless so a serverless function spins up you do your thing you return and it spins down that thing is gone that instance of that service yeah. is just completely gone so there's absolutely no state and one of the things that the implications behind that is like maintaining database connections and serverless, yeah. you're not, you're not going to really be able to like maintain these connections to databases, right? Cause it's spinning up and down yeah. in your traditional server. You could like, you could have thread pooling or whatever to connect to your database 
and have that stuff just kind of there available for you to use and not go away until you restart the app. So part of this implication is like one of the reasons you may not want to do session ID and look it up in a database is that there's probably a little bit of overhead now, not only in the startup cost of your serverless functions, but also connecting to the actual database each time, which then has led to now lots of database options are more like API first, where you just make this transactional request to the database and it sends you information back or does whatever you're trying to do. Fauna is a, is a really good example of that, of them like being optimized for the Jamstack and specifically for serverless because you're not having to hold on to uh, these database connections. You can uh, transactionally make that request, get it back. And that's kind okay. of the way that, uh, that it would work in the serverless world. So I think the, a little bit of implication in terms of potentially speed of serverless functions of the cold start and then also just completely or complete lack of um, of state. There's no no persistent state whatsoever between uh, between serverless functions. But all that said, I would say that like JSON web tokens are a very common approach for handling authentication, especially in uh, serverless world. Okay. Yeah. No. I, I think it makes sense based on just how it operates. Um, so, in terms of uh, uh, I'll be honest, I've never used Auth0. <laughs> so I'm curious, <laughs> like, uh, uh, and I, I'm not saying that to throw shade. I, I definitely want to try it out. Um, a t something like Auth0, what, what does it provide for us exactly? I'm, I'm assuming it definitely supports JWT. The company wrote a handbook on it. So there's JWT authentication. <laughs> um, but but the product itself, like in terms of authentication or, or, or what it comes with, like what what does the entire product or SDK encompass? Yeah. Um, so I think the, the general goal is to make, make authentication and authorization as easy as possible for developers. Okay. That's what like everything about all zero is geared towards the experience for the developer. Um, so with that becomes like in the dashboard, you can create a new application. When you create a new application, Auth0 is gonna like have a database ready for users. It's gonna be prepared to handle sign up requests and sign in requests, and yeah. it'll give you um, like a, a login and sign up form. And it works through this redirect flow um, using OAuth2 and OpenID Connect. Um, so I think part of the first thing, first and foremost, is like people hear those words or they've never heard them before, and they're like, I don't know what the hell that is. That's part of the goal here is that like you shouldn't as as the everyday developer, you shouldn't have to know the details of these authentication workflows like you shouldn't have to know okay. the very specifics of those It might be useful, but we can help abstract some of that from you. So um, inside of the dashboard, you can create a new application, it could be a single page app or a traditional web server app Next.js falls into that category with their serverless stuff. Okay. And from there, there's getting started docs to say, like, here's a sample project that you can do in React, Angular, Vue, Java, .NET, Python. Like, here's all these starter apps. Pick which one you're going to work with. Download this okay. starter app, add a couple of variables uh, about your application. Uh, and then we have SDKs for these different platforms as well, again, to make okay. that process as easy as possible. So Next.js is my favorite one because of the flexibility okay. that it adds. So in Next.js, you add the Auth0 SDK. There's yeah. a dynamic route that you define. Okay. So uh, Next.js is uh, file-based routing. So if you create a specific file called about in this directory, that's going to create yeah. a, um, a page slash about. If you create that in the API directory, it's going to create an API at slash API slash whatever it is. So you create this dynamic route, and you basically like import and export the all zero object and pass it your okay. config flags and behind the scenes what it does is it generates your login route your log out okay. route your callback route i'll come back to that in a second and your okay. um profile route there i think it's a me route so it does all this okay. stuff behind the scenes and then it gives you hooks that you can use uh in react to get access to the user to see whether or not the user is logged in um, okay. And so then your responsibility is to add a link that goes to slash login and a link that goes to slash log out and then toggle between them based on if the user's logged in. And that's more or less all you have to do. Like the SDK in Next.js takes care of so much for you. It gives you some extra hooks for protecting your page routes and your API routes, which is really, really nice. 
Um, and then kind of the next level of that, so that's like the getting started uh, initial okay. setup. The next level of this is like helping enable things like multi-factor authentication, doing things with like device biometrics. I'm working on a video where you can use Auth0 and turn on a, a config flag and then now be able yeah. to log into my app on my Mac using my fingerprint. So like the fingerprint sensor oh, that's awesome. that people are used to on their laptop or on their mobile devices, like a lot of people are already using that to authenticate on that device. Okay. Now Auth0 can help, I mean, not even help, like basically do it for you to facilitate adding that yeah. functionality to your apps. So there's, there's multi-factor authentication, there's like security best practices and staying on top of vulnerabilities and that sort of stuff. Like it's a team of, I don't know the number, 100 developers or so that are like, that's what they do on a daily basis is make sure that they're up to date. So there's lots of these like extra features. There's enterprise things. There's connecting to um, single sign-on and SAML and all these things that I don't spend a lot of time with just not being in the enterprise space. But that's where yeah. you start to, to really scale up functionality and, um, and benefits of Auth0. But the easiest story is just you're a developer, you want to build something, Aussier can help you add authentication much faster, especially in terms of feature set, than you would be able to do that on your own. So you save yourself yeah. time, you save yourself money in development time, and you can progress on the thing that you want to build quicker. No, I, I think um, that's a, a great point about that, <laughs> is, is not having to worry about it. Um, because mm -hmm. uh, when I was working in identity management on this, on this one particular project, they decided... I took over a project which was a custom identity management solution, and I was oh. it it was a nightmare to maintain <laughs> and you know just constantly updating. And then finally we went with a a box solution. This is like years ago, but it it just as soon as we went with the box solution, it was like just mm -hmm. one I I didn't have to maintain anything anymore. It was just more oh. like set it up, deploy it the first time, and then after that. You know, if there was some updates, maybe, you know, uh, this was a C sharp SharePoint project. So it was just a question of updating like the DLLs <laughs> and stuff. But after that, it was, yeah. you know, didn't have to worry about anything. And I, this, it's kind of what you were saying, you know, like I just, I want to build a product. I, I don't need to be a security expert. I just want to be able to log in, log out. And for sure, you can definitely oh. read up more on these things and learn about them. But if you, if you're trying to, build a product it's it's not you know let let the experts do that part you know so uh, it, yeah I, I and that's feel that that's yeah that's i mean that's basically the epitome of the jamstack like jamstack for me is taking all these services that are out there and now combining them to build what you want you look at like all the hella cms options you look at netlify or sell all these different hosting options look at image optimization stuff that cloudinary does like you don't need to be an expert in any of those places you can learn how to leverage this, the really cool stuff that they've already done and the expertise that they have in those specific areas and combine them to build whatever the product is that you're looking to build. A uh, question yeah. in the chat from Jacob about yeah, Jacob. all this being built into uh, Next.js. So this is, if you search just all zero Next.js, uh, you can get to the GitHub repository for the library. And that'll show okay. you the details of the stuff that um, I've set up and the stuff that I was just talking about in terms of adding authentication with Auth0 in Next.js. Yeah. And if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out on Twitter or something after. Yeah, yeah. And I'll, I'll be dropping uh, James's links again later where you can follow him and get in contact with him. Uh, yeah, you're talking about Next there. I, I do like the, the the page route API they have just like Mm -hmm. naming pages and then that's that's your route uh or the dynamic ones like yeah uh, th there's a lot of i i know we're not talking specifically about next.js here but it, it, there's a lot of nice things in next.js if you're working in react land so it's uh yep. definitely nice it just yeah. gives you the flexibility to do like you could treat it like a single page <laughs> drop my ring you can treat it like a single page awesome. app just like it's react like anything, yeah, yeah. anything you could do in React, you could just do the same exact thing in Next.js. But then you also have the built-in routing. You have your API routes. You can build a full stack app. Um, yeah, it just that level of flexibility to do exactly what you want, when you want, and how you want it to be done 
that's yeah. that's what it's all about for me. So I yeah, I'm a huge huge fan of Next.js. Obviously the community is too cuz Next.js has just been blowing up. So I'm excited yeah, yeah. to see, I don't know, like what what the landscape of web development looks like <laughs> as we continue to evolve so quickly. Yeah, for sure, and it's it's keeps getting faster and faster too. Um the uh you were mentioning about like having some hooks so I imagine like a a use authentication or something. Um uh, we're talking about React right now, but if I'm not a React developer and I'm like, I want to create my view app, whether it's with Nux.js or something, or, you know, I got on the Svelte train, which is, is uh, <laughs> a lot of folks are enjoying that as well. Uh, can they still integrate OAuth, uh, sorry, uh, Auth0 fairly easily into those other frameworks as well? Yep. Um, so I will say we are a little bit more optimized in the React and Next.js space because we have separate libraries specifically for those two. And then we have our Auth0 Spa.js package, which is more generically for Spa frameworks to do Auth. So if okay. you're in uh, Vue specifically, then you could use that. If you're in Svelte, you could use that. If you then are doing uh, like serverless functions with either one of those, like if you're using Nux on top of yeah view or if you're using svelte kit on top of svelte um you can look into potentially depending on how things uh are set up like one of our uh, express or server side sdks as well um okay. and that just really depends on again like out of different auth options which way uh you want to go we also have we have a angular sdk as well so we have specific okay. ones for angular react um next and then i think the rest of them would be are uh, spa frameworks or spa okay. framework that you can use across those different ones that I mentioned. Okay, yeah. No, oh, that's cool. And it's good that you're supporting all of those because like they're they're all popular in their own right. I mean, I know, I know. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I'm a fan of React. We use Preact at at Forum actually, so not React, but oh, React, cool. But uh, yeah, but nice. but it, uh, the nice thing about Preact is it has this compatibility there, so anything. Uh, that you use in React land, you can use in Preact. So we could use Auth0 uh, if if we needed to. Um, nice. Yeah, it's yeah, it's kind of interesting uh, what they've done. So yeah, I've never actually um, I've never actually used Preact. It's it's so it's uh, really cool that you're using that. Yeah, uh, Jason Miller is the creator. He works at Google now. He's uh, I think he's on their. I think he might be on the Google Chrome DevRel team. I think that's what he does. But okay. uh, uh, but yeah, this uh, he's a he's a fan of making things super fast and performant, and that's how Preact came to be. Mm -hmm. But it's it's essentially the same API as uh, React. So if you know React, moving to Preact is uh, it's not like a difficult pretty leap. simple. Um, and I think yeah. even Next.js, you can actually, if you install Preact, they have a plugin to allow you to use Preact instead of React. I'm not positive about that. Oh, really? Um, okay. Yeah. So, so you can literally Interesting. just I didn't know interchange that. it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, the only thing I know, at least with Preact compared to React, is they're not going to be, they're not doing anything related to like suspense or concurrent mode and all that stuff. Hmm. So I'm not sure what the story there is. I I think it, I think it's just like we're not doing it because we don't need to. Uh, <laughs> so, but I, I'm curious how that's gonna work with like if you have packages that you use in Preact that are trying to support concurrent mode. I'm sure they'll develop some kind of compatibility layer because they've they've already have a compatibility layer, and like for example. In, in the forum code base, we use uh, Reach UI, which is from like the folks from React Training, um, and mm -hmm. that's a, a React package, obviously. And we're able to use it with Preact uh, without any problems. So it's uh, cool. That's pretty neat. But uh, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, what was I gonna say? Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of. In terms of authentication, you know, we talked about best practices and stuff, but in terms of, uh, you know, are there any kind of gotchas? Uh, in terms, I mean, I know Auth0 provides a, a full-fledged solution, so maybe none of these gotchas are re really even an issue because, like you said, you have a security team and everything that, that works with it. But I'm, I'm just wondering if there's 
anything authentication or authorization wise where could be gotchas for folks uh, i mean you talked about uh no not even the different domains that that's already handled with jwt um i guess if part if you're of setting up yeah go ahead <laughs> um one thing is like validating of jwts um okay. like if if you're not validating jwts correctly then they don't really mean much um okay. so i think that's that's something that you that is you it's your responsibility on your end depending on whether or not there's an sdk available so some sometimes there is an sdk available like we have an express sdk and it, you can have a hook that says like require user logged in i don't know what the function name is uh but something like that um but yeah making sure, making sure that you're um validating your jwts correctly i think is an okay. important one so if you're working on a more obscure framework without a library to help you do that. And that would be something to spend a little bit of time researching to make sure that you're checking expiration times in addition to um, just the the verify signature. Okay. And I guess I guess the expiration time is just like a cookie, like your session time, just same idea. Uh, it wouldn't be a cookie specifically in this case. It would just be a property of the, like in the body of the JSON web token. Um, but comparing yeah. that property with the current time when you're, when you're reading it, checking the algorithm that assigned it, there's another property called the audience, which is basically like okay. who's the intended audience of this token. So making sure okay. that that audience property matches with I, like what your server name is for lack of a like it's okay. it's not a, it's an arbitrary name but making sure yeah. that like this token was created to be sent to me is another thing to to check as well okay and in ter in terms of the uh, like correctly validating is this is there is part of like the sdk that auth zero provides is there like a i don't know like a, you know auth zero dot verified token and then you pass in a token is there something like that or is it, is this kind of like a bespoke thing folks have to do themselves it's so you'll probably be covered with the sdk and it's even simpler than um than what you said there so uh okay. there's hooks in several different places to protect your like api routes and next or just like endpoints and node and express and those yeah. hooks can basically like some variation of like wrapping an endpoint with require logged okay. in or something like that. And that thing will go ahead and do the actual validation of the token and then give you access to the user inside of your endpoint. And it will automatically return like a, a 401 unauthorized if, if the token is not valid or if there's no token, um, it'll automatically handle that. So by the time, so by just using that hook, by the time you actually get yeah. to your endpoint, the code that you write, you can assume the user's already logged in and then you have access to that, whatever the user information is from that token. Okay. Um, another question I had, and uh, I, I'm pretty sure I know what the answer is, but I just want to verify it. But like, we've been talking about Jamstack and even some server-side scenarios. Uh, we've kind of been talking in the context of the JavaScript language or Node.js, but I imagine Auth0 provides like, uh, these SDKs for like say C sharp Java or like other mm -hmm. languages is is there any languages it doesn't support I mean I know there's a lot of languages out there but like I, <laughs> I imagine like the co the common ones are covered or yeah I I'd have to go and double check like all of the specifics but yeah the major languages I think that you would think about we either have SDKs I, I would say we already have SDKs like we're working on a new Python SDK I think now um okay. .NET SDK just went through an update or they're doing I think they're in a beta version of a new version of the SDK I think uh but yeah okay. across those different major uh languages frameworks um there's most likely an SDK that's already there okay cool 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 yeah I mean I figured it, it made sense it's just I know like <laughs> like as web developers a lot of us are really just into the the JavaScript focused on right JavaScript now. yeah so uh just wanted to potentially ask the obvious. Uh, uh, yep. Oscar, who's creature next in the chat, it doesn't have a question at the moment because he's absorbing everything. He's it's like a sponge. There's a bit. He's like there's too much information coming in. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure uh, taking it all in. Do the rewatch. Um, yeah. I can't think of anything else in regards to uh, 
the Jamstack and authentication. Um, I don't know if you wanted to maybe talk about something else, we, uh, maybe content creation, or I don't know if you have a hard stop soon or what, uh, um, but because I know you're big into content creation. So yeah, like, like you said, you got started uh, when you're at Microsoft, right? Because folks mm -hmm. kept asking you the same thing and you're like, well, you know yep. what, it, it probably got annoying having to always answer. So the videos. Um, so uh, you have a, a YouTube channel. I'll just drop the links there again to where people can follow you. Uh, when did you, was it when you were at Microsoft that you started to take uh, content creation really seriously or was it a little after that? Uh, it was where I started content creation. I, okay. It was about three, maybe four now, which it, it's hard to keep up. A few years okay. ago is when I started taking it seriously. Um, and especially like this last year for me, specifically on YouTube has been really big and that that's been the consistency that had kind of been there, but like even amped up a little bit, but also kind of like the experimentation of trying to figure out what kind of videos work, what types of titles and thumbnails, like just trying to help grow the exposure that the content that I create gets, um, has been, uh, been really huge for me in the past year on YouTube. And then um i in theory i want to take more of my videos and make corresponding blog posts out of them just because different people learn in different ways and there's there's that yeah. much more opportunity to get in front of more people and i i just sure. i don't do as well with blog posts to be honest um even if i've already got like a framework for the layout from from a video i just don't yeah. do it it's so much easier for me to explain something verbally um or type out the code live than it is for me to uh, do a blog post so i don't do as much of that as i want okay. um i do live streams uh usually once a week sometimes two maybe three if i uh, do some extra ones in there a week also and then i don't know if you knew this but i started um, a podcast with my co-host amy dutton uh, oh, a couple really? of months ago called compressed fm oh, cool, cool. uh so we've been cool. doing doing that podcast for the last couple of months and that's been that's been a ton of fun to work on especially like learning learning about a completely new area of content that neither one of us had ever done before so kind of figuring it out together has been a, a fun process so i'm definitely going to subscribe to that and, and listen to it uh in a nutshell web what what is the podcast about uh like a, or do you just decide to talk about all kinds of stuff or or do you have like a kind of like a, a focused area of stuff you talk about general category of web development and web design so amy okay. um is a really really good developer and designer um like one of honestly one of the best designers i've seen so she has much more to offer okay. in that regard than i do um so we try to keep a balance of like doing design and uh web development and getting into like freelance and technologies and frameworks that we're excited about we talked about live streaming the other day we've talked about our desk setups and the equipment and stuff that we use um okay. so yeah web development design is the general uh category and then there's there's a million different things that we could do that still still kind of fall under uh the same same area okay so you definitely definitely have a lot of things on the go and uh Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not positive, but I, I could have sworn last year I saw in a tweet of yours. Did did you write a a book on YouTube content creation, or, or am I am I mistaken? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. What I did. It? Okay. okay yeah. <laughs> um, um. Yeah, it was the you or the developer's guide to starting a YouTube channel. Um, and okay. I kind of talked all about like all the benefits and things that I've gotten, like first and foremost is my career. Like when I went to get back into DevRel as a full-time gig, I, you almost don't even have to send a resume. You can just send along a YouTube channel that's full of videos explaining stuff because that's a big part of, of what DevRel is. Um, so that okay. I think YouTube, having a, having a YouTube channel, a consistent YouTube channel is something that like enabled, made it much easier for me to get, uh, get back into DevRel full-time. It's also been basically the catalyst and the the position that I'm in now, like we created a role in all zero to help uh, with my career growth, but also to kind of leverage that expertise that I've got from doing videos and okay. personal uh, channel and then for the all zero channel um, and then exploring other medias as well. 
Um, so there's lots of lots of career benefits. There's lots of just like personal growth opportunities. Like okay. the better you are at explaining things to people, whether or not your job is DevRel, the better off you're going to be in your career because people like it's hard. It's hard to be a, a senior engineer or a principal engineer if you can't communicate things to non-technical people and you can't help other people grow along the way. Like that's a big part of what it means yeah. to progress in software engineering. Um, so yeah, it talks a lot about just the benefits of doing YouTube, how to get started, equipment, that sort of stuff. Um, kind of goals that you can set yourself, expectations for like what it's going to be like for X number of months or years or that sort of stuff. Uh, so yeah, so it was kind of everything, everything that I had to offer in terms of what I've learned from doing YouTube now for eight or nine years, I guess, is uh, okay, so ago is when I officially started. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. Well, no, that's great that the that you compiled a book about that. I'm sure that, that that's a great resource for folks looking to get into YouTube. Uh, without like obviously giving away the, the whole contents of the book, do you have like maybe like one or two things that you could mention to folks like if they're just getting started out with YouTube? Uh, the simplest one, and people have probably heard this before, so just like create the first video, create the first blog post, do the first live stream, do the first, po first podcast episode like you're if you if you're trying to make it perfect the first time, yeah. one that's never going to happen. You're going to put unnecessary pressure on yourself, and it's going to prevent you from actually getting started. So, like okay. the really blunt, you want to get started in something is legitimately to to get started to do that first one because yeah, it's yeah. all like everything is an iterative cycle, right? Like do your first one have it be not so great, but then realize the things that you didn't like and do those better next time and continue to evolve okay. that. Like the evolution of my videos has happened over the course of eight years. Like I, I didn't yeah. start creating videos in the format that they're in now when I got started. Uh, if you watch an, a first video of mine or first yeah. handful of videos, it's completely different than what I'm capable of doing now. So um, hands down, my number one piece of advice is is literally just, um just do it just do the first one and then continue to iterate from there okay uh th i think o oscar who's creature next in the chat says uh it's curious how to get feedback on what you're sharing is correct like if you put out content and he's saying i can see the benefit of making videos but someone new how do you ensure the content is actually helpful and correct uh i, I think it kind of yeah. ties into what you just um, said about just putting it out first <laughs> for sure yeah you definitely definitely have to have something out there to then get feedback on it but you can also like uh, like i i finally did a video on svelte and svelte kit did okay. two videos actually and the reason i did that is because i've seen people tweet about it and other people create content around it and love it so like i've okay. seen enough conversation about svelte that i know people enjoy it and i know people are interested in svelte even if they're not using it in production yeah. even if they're not doing it at their job they're really interested in it so i think you have the ability to gauge just what the community is doing what they're posting about on twitter the talks that you see at conferences the talks that you see at meetups uh the conversations you see in discord the things you see people live streaming you can take that and make yeah. educated guesses of what kind of content is going to be the most relevant another thing is yeah. to define like who your audience is and do that per video like you could say in this video this is a complete beginner's thing and then next video say this is not for beginner. So if you are here, I want to make sure you should already know Node.js and React and we're going to build this thing. Okay. So if you set expectations for people, uh, maybe on a video by video basis, I think you set yourself up for more success. But then getting feedback is is one comes from like more exposure it comes from growth. Yeah, yeah. You get a lot more feedback the more you grow. Right. So there's kind of this like how do you do both? And and part of that is just sharing over and over again, sharing the stuff that you're working on on Twitter and Discord. And if you have the opportunity to speak at a meetup, to give a talk on something that gives you more of a reason for people to trust your knowledge in a certain area and want to go see what other types of content you have available. Yeah, no, I think that's that's great advice. And I like the the bit about like, you know, preempting in the video that, you know, like, you know, if you don't know this, you know, you know, check out the beginner video or like, you know, ramp up a bit on this before you start because it'll be more enjoyable. And I think uh, Sean, Sean Wang, who uh, uh, I feel uh, is, is definitely not synonymous, 
but he, he's very closely associated to learn in public. I feel like he rejuvenated that whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, he always says like he puts out stuff and like if something isn't right, you know, if he's tweeted it out on Twitter or he had a blog post, people will say, oh, it actually it's this or whatever. And then he just takes the feedback and then he'll update things or like, update, yeah. you know, so like Oscar, it, it, you know, in, in regards to your point about like, is it correct? I think putting out what you think makes sense to you at the time and then and hopefully uh, the folks that do provide feedback is hopefully constructive and you can go, oh, OK, oh, I, I didn't know that or OK, I'll <laughs> I'll correct. It's a little harder to edit a video once it's been uploaded, but, you know, you could always do another video, I guess, and just say like, uh, yep. I don't know, this is actually the, the Absolutely. Scenario, but but I, I definitely <laughs> agree with you about like just getting stuff out there because I started streaming on my own channel pretty much like once in Montreal pandemic lockdown happened. Uh, I, I got inspiration from Jason Langsdorf who streams a lot. Uh, yeah. I, I like, I really like what he does as well. And I, I kind of took inspiration from him and I just started doing it. And like you said, in terms of like, what your first video or stream looks like compared to what you do now is completely different. Like last That's year, totally different. I have a, I took a screenshot of it. It was like, uh, you know, there's no chat or like bottom like header. Like I have on the dev stream here. I, I do something similar on my own stream, but like the original one was just like black screen, you know, VS code was open and there was just a small square of me in the corner on my webcam. Mm -hmm. And then it, and it's just evolved over time and just, you know, learning the tools as well. Like I, I always tell folks like whatever you're doing, know your tools because it gives you superpowers. So like OBS, for which is what most folks use to stream. I've gotten more familiar with it over the past year and a bit, you know, so I'm like, you know, it's it's all that. And it, it's just kind of neat to see the progression, you know, because I'm sure like yep. you said, if you looked at your first video, you'd be like, Oof. <laughs> I mean, maybe maybe the content was still really good, but you're like production wise, like I I've seen a lot of your streams and I've seen your YouTube videos and the, the production quality is really high. So and that's not something that just happens overnight, uh, you know, so it's. Uh, yeah, just keep at it. <laughs> yeah, I, I can say I've watched a lot of YouTube videos about creating YouTube videos. <laughs> I've done okay. I've done my like thousands of hours of research into the stuff that I do, just like everybody else will. Yeah. And then there's like I mean, there's other things too, which I think come along once you probably get more noticed or you maybe start generating some revenue from your your channel. Uh, but you know, like you can change your equipment and stuff, you know, like mm -hmm. you know, there there is a price tag to some of these things, obviously. Like uh as we can see right now, like I'm on a pretty decent Logitech webcam, but James is on a really nice camera that you can, I, I can clearly see. Uh, it's just, it looks really good, you know? So once you make it big, get a good camera, folks. Uh, or maybe, maybe yeah, get it before those you are... get big. I don't know. No, I definitely, I definitely wouldn't, unless you just want to have it, I would start simple and upgrade yeah. as you go. Yeah, for sure. Cool, cool. Well, listen, we're uh, we're getting close to uh, two thirty here. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to discuss, but uh, if not, we could call it here. Either way, I'm happy to keep talking. I don't have a hard stop myself, um, but uh, um, I think most of the questions have been asked in the chat. Um, yeah, you okay cool. with calling? Yeah. It here? I... Yeah, I'm good with that. I don't have anything uh, additional to add, but if anybody has any uh, questions, feel free to reach out on uh, Twitter or I've got a Discord called Learn, Build, Teach that you can join and ask questions and share code snippets and things that you've worked on, videos and articles and stuff that people have created, which is kind of cool to see more and more people get involved in that. Uh, so yeah, if people have any uh, questions about any of the stuff we talked about, feel free to reach out after. Yeah, and uh, I'll drop the links again in a second, but definitely give James a follow on, a subscribe on YouTube, a follow on Twitter if you aren't already. Uh, he puts out a lot of great content, uh, super nice guy. So 
Uh, just want to say thanks again, James, for coming on. Uh, like I said, I know you got a lot of stuff on the go. It's it's always appreciated when folks take the time to come on the stream. So uh, thanks again. And uh, next week, folks, what who do we have next week? Oh, yeah. Next week on the stream, we're going to have uh, Jonan Scheffler from New Relic. He's uh, head of DevRel there, I believe. He's going to be here with... A bunch of folks uh they do a stream called code school so we're going to kind of have a code school dev mm. edition so be sure to check that out same time next week on wednesday 5 p.m utc and that's it for now folks uh take care and i'll see you next week with christina bye